Chapter 4 God Judges the Nations And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. Genesis 18, 20 through 21. The day of doom was about to arrive for Sodom and Gomorrah. They had been the most blessed city in the land of Canaan. It was to Sodom that Lot turned, when offered any place in the land by Abraham. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zoar. Genesis 13.10 But their hour was about to come. God is the judge of the nations. Judgment is the fourth point of the biblical covenant structure. He created the earth. He also brought the judgment of the great flood. After the flood, God created the nations in an act of his sovereign judgment. Genesis 10. After they attempted to create a one world state, meaning a one state world, he divided mankind linguistically at the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, 1 through 9. The pyramid of power that mankind was about to build at Babel was destroyed by God. He then scattered mankind across the face of the earth. This was a curse on mankind, yet it was also a blessing for it withdrew men from the jurisdiction of a one-world bureaucratic state. It divided mankind into independent, sovereign, language-based nations, thereby destroying forever the possibility of fulfilling covenant-breaking man's dream of man becoming a unified God, a decentralized political power, leaving men free to work out their cultural gifts and skills in their own way. God went to Sodom and Gomorrah as a judge. He went to see whether the sinful outcry of these cities was as bad as it sounded. Like Abel's blood crying to God from the ground, Genesis 4.10, sin cries up to God, and God hears. But as a judge, he first conducts a trial, like the one he conducted in the garden, when he cross-examined Adam and Eve before bringing judgment, or just as he cross-examined Cain after Cain had murdered Abel, Genesis 4, he gathers evidence Then he judges it in the light of his law. Then he announces his judgment and brings either blessings or cursings. Collective Responsibility Abraham bargained with God to spare Sodom, and therefore Lot, as soon as he was told that God was about to judge Sodom. Wilt thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Abraham asked, Genesis 18.23. Are righteous men who happen to be dwelling among the unrighteous also to be destroyed just because of the sins of the immoral majority? God's answer was clear. Yes. Abraham knew this, but he haggled with God over the price. Will you spare the city for 50 righteous people? Yet Abraham's language is highly significant. Far be it from thee to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? 1825. God is the judge of all the earth, and not just of some of his people at at certain times in history. All nations are subject to his rule. His law is for all the nations. God, knowing full well that there was but one righteous man in the city, was willing to promise Abraham that he would indeed spare the city for the sake of 50 righteous people. So Abraham tried to get a better deal. What about 45 righteous people? God agreed. He would spare it for 45, 1828. And so it went until Abraham got God to agree to spare the city for as few as 10 righteous people, 1832. Then God sent two angels to Sodom in order to warn Lot to get out. He in turn warned his daughters and their prospective betrothed husbands. But the two men scoffed, Genesis 19:14. So only Lot, his wife, and his two daughters left the city, and God then sent fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone. These words have become synonymous in the English language with preaching that emphasizes hell and final judgment. This is quite proper. This is exactly what God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is supposed to remind us of. But what Christians fail to recognize is the context of those fearful words. God was not raining fire and brimstone down on the heads of people as individuals. He was raining fire and brimstone down on a pair of cities. Individuals perished, of course, but they perished as members of cities whose sins had cried out to God for a collective judgment. Abraham, in his negotiating with God, had described God well, the judge of all the earth.
God would have spared the two cities for the sake of a few as ten righteous people. But this was easy for God to agree to. There were not that many righteous people in those cities. The principle is clear, however. God is sometimes willing to spare a large number of evil people for the sake of a few righteous ones. It was so bad in Jeremiah's day that God challenged him to locate a single righteous person. Roam to and fro the streets of Jerusalem, and look now, and take note, and seek in her open squares. If you can find a man, if there is one who desires justice, who seeks the truth, then I will pardon her. Jeremiah 5.1 God knew that Jeremiah would not find that person. In Elijah's day, over a century earlier than Jeremiah, God promised the destruction of Israel, the northern kingdom. They would be destroyed by the sword and carried into captivity. God promised to Preserve 7,000 righteous people who would not bow the knee to Baal, 1 Kings 19.18. In this case, there were not enough people in the land to save Israel from God's historic judgment. Still, this did not mean that every righteous person would die. He would keep a handful of them alive, not many, but a few. In this case, he judged the collective, but kept a remnant alive in the midst of the judgment. This, too, is God's way of dealing with men in history. Israel was judged for the sin of one man, Achan. Thirty-six men died because of one man's sin, Joshua 7.5. David's sin of numbering the people brought judgment to the nation and the death of 70,000 men of the people, 2 Samuel 24.15. What God does is to look at those in authority. Are they righteous men? If so, he is willing to delay his judgment for a season for the sake of the righteous leader or even a few righteous residents. God delivered Judah out of the hands of of the army of Assyria, and the city did not fall into the Babylonians until righteous king Hezekiah had died. Hezekiah had prayed the prayer that God always honored in the Old Testament era. He prayed that the army of the enemy would not capture the city, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou alone, O Lord, art God. 2 Kings 19.19 For this prayer, and also for the sake of the memory of King David, verse 34, God spared his collective people from external judgment, but his mercy lasted only for a few more years. Then the prophet Jeremiah and other righteous people went into captivity in Babylon. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord shall perform this, verse 31. The judgment came, blessings, the survival of a remnant, and cursings, captivity for all. There would be continuity, the survival of a remnant and Judah's eventual return to the land, within discontinuity, the enslavement of the people to Babylon and then to Medio Persia. The writings of the prophets are filled with judgments against the nations. Isaiah warns the following nations of the judgment to come after he is finished judging Israel Assyria, Isaiah 14 25 through 27. Philistia 14:29 through 31, Moab 15:16, Damascus 17, Egypt 19, Tyre and Tarshish 23. Indeed, the whole earth will be judged. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface, and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like the priest, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed the laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Isaiah 24, 1-6 The prophet Obadiah warned Edom, the heirs of Esau, of coming judgment. Nahum warned Nineveh. Zephaniah warned Ammon and Moab, the heirs of Lot's incest. 2, 8-11 He also warned Ethiopia, verse 12, and Nineveh, verses 13-15. Jonah also warned Nineveh, and Nineveh's people believed and repented for a season. Jeremiah warned pagan nations too, verses 46 through 51. Everyone is guilty in Adam. God graciously allows men to live, history to continue, but God can call in man's debts at any time. He has the legal right at any time to bring total judgment in history.
collectives rise and fall as units, despite the fact that every member is personally responsible before God. The church is also a collective before God, 1 Corinthians 12, yet each member is fully responsible before God. The blessings and cursings of God fall on collectives, as Deuteronomy 28 spells out in detail. Individualism, denying the covenant. Because so few Christians have heard or believed the message of the covenant, they have been easily led into a non-Christian outlook called individualism. They have neglected the social implications of the doctrine of the Trinity. They have, in theory, recognized the equal ultimacy of the one and the many in the Godhead, but they have not recognized the equal ultimacy of the one and the many in society. This failure has led to disastrous consequences. Christians have been unable to challenge modern statist humanism, the unity of the one, without adopting the arguments of modern anarchists, the pluralism of the many. There has been a tendency for humanists to overemphasize collective responsibility because of their commitment to collectivism, planning, and the denial of personal responsibility before God and man. On the other hand, there has been a tendency among Bible-believing Christians to overemphasize the case for individualism because of their commitment to personal salvation at the expense of social and institutional transformation and healing. They want to restrict the limits of God's salvation because they do not want the responsibility of applying God's law to society. Thus, they have denied the rule of God's law outside Christian churches and Christian families. They have been consistent in this anti-covenantal position by also denying that God blesses and curses nations and other collectives, with the exception, inconsistently, of churches and families. To some degree, they still recognize the covenant in churches and families, and so they recognize God's sovereignty, his institutional authority and hierarchy, his law, his judgment, and his continuity of relationships over time. But by denying, denying that God rules over national and cultural collectives, modern Christians have denied the covenant. This has left humanists in control of politics, education, the media, and just about everything else. There is no doubt that each person stands alone on Judgment Day. He is not judged by a committee, unless we mean the Trinity, nor do other human committee members stand at his side and take some of the blame. This accurate vision of final judgment has led Christians to a false conclusion. Since God judges individuals as individuals outside of history, he therefore judges only individuals inside history. But the testimony of the Old Testament is very different. It describes the judgments of God against nations and collectives far more often than his judgments against individuals. New Testament Judgments It could be argued that in the New Testament, God's relationship to men has changed. Now he judges only individuals. But then how can we make sense out of the fall of the Roman Empire? Daniel prophesied that God's kingdom would crush the fourth empire, Rome. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breasts uh, and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at, at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel 2, 31 through 35. What was the interpretation of the king's dream? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was the head of gold, the greatest king. There would be three kingdoms after his, ending with the fourth, which was iron, breaking all other kingdoms and consolidating them in clay and iron, verses 40 through 42. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever, verse 44. Christ established his kingdom in history as manifested by, but not encompassed by, the church. This took place during the Roman Empire. The fulfillment of this prophecy came as the Roman Empire disintegrated. Rival emperors fought each other, and the church became the only institution with enough strength to pull society out of the chaos that Rome became. 
This happened three centuries after the cross, so God still deals with collectives as collectives in the New Testament times, just as the prophecy of Daniel promised. So the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Verse 45. Antinomianism. Those who deny that God judges collectives in the midst of time are arguing implicitly that God does not place nations and groups under his laws. It is an argument in favor of God's law over the actions of individuals, but not over collectives. It is an argument against biblical law, social, institutional, economic, cultural, and civil. This sort of argument is not simply implicit in our day. It has become explicit. Christian intellectuals, especially in Christian colleges, repeat endlessly that the Bible offers no blueprints for society. Christians are regenerated, they say, but God has given his people no revealed standards or appropriate sanctions in the Bible. But what about the Old Testament standards and sanctions? These are no longer valid, the antinomians say. Modern fundamentalists, until very recently, have argued the same way. Because of this, they long ago abdicated their role as God's representatives and ambassadors and turned over the Christian colleges, Christian magazines, and other institutions to liberal intellectuals who have spent their academic lives defending the legal autonomy of today's covenant-breaking pagan antinomians who are in fact tyrants. The pagans have set the terms of the debate in every field, and Christian antinomians have agreed with the pagan starting point. The God of the Bible is irrelevant to the terms of discourse. A God who does not judge in history according to his law is irrelevant to history. Sanctification. Moral regeneration is a fact of conversion. But how is it to be understood? We know that Christ died for the sins of all mankind because only his death satisfied God's covenantal stipulations governing man. History went forward after Adam's sin only because God looked forward in time to the cross and then he imputed this perfection of Christ's humanity as well as his death and resurrection back to all mankind. He does not bring all men to saving grace, but he certainly gives all men gifts that they do not deserve on their own merits. He brings rain and sunshine on all mankind, Matthew 5.45. He does this only because his wrath has been placated by Christ's work on the cross. Thus, God is the Savior of all men, especially of believers, 1 Timothy 4.10. So all men are sanctified, set apart in history in the limited sense that, for a time, they are set apart from God's perfect judgment. They are given time, what we call can call a stay of execution. Christ's death and resurrection are the basis of this stay of execution for the covenant breakers. Nothing else will suffice. When man is regenerated by God's grace, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, God imputes Christ's perfection to him, not Christ's divinity, but his perfect humanity. God says in effect, I declare you not guilty, for I will look on my son's perfect righteousness and his sacrificial death instead of looking at you. This is a judicial act. God declares us not guilty. He does so on the basis of Christ's objective fulfillment of God's objective law. Christ's moral perfection is therefore imputed to man. We call this perfection definitive sanctification. Yet Christians still sin. Paul writes about running a good race, 1 Corinthians 9.24-26, and fighting the good fight, 1 Timothy 6.12. Life is a struggle, a moral, ethical struggle. We attempt in history to conform our lives progressively to the image of Christ's perfection, to, ne to deny that we are still sinners is to make liars of ourselves. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, 8. So this struggle to improve our lives so that we will measure up to Christ's perfection never ends in until we die. We call this progressive sanctification. Then, at the day of judgment, God declares us righteous again and rewards us in terms of our works, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 14. Of course, our ability to do these works is itself given to us by God's grace, Ephesians 2.10. So there is final moral sanctification. We call this final sanctification. We preach all three kinds of personal sanctification, definitive, progressive, and final. If we did not preach definitive sanctification, we could not explain how we pass from death to life, how God makes us new creatures. If we did not preach progressive personal sanctification, we could not explain why sin does not immediately kill us, 
we also could not explain the rewards God gives to each of us on the day of judgment because of our individual acts of righteousness. We need a doctrine of final sanctification to enable us to escape final judgment. God declares at the end of history that his gift of salvation to us was valid. Collective Sanctification Collectives do not have souls to bless or curse. Nevertheless, they do have effects in history, as we have seen. God judges them in history, as we have also seen. But if he judges them, then this judgment must be in terms of their performance for good or evil. The collective sins of Sodom cried out to God. What else can this mean but that God decided that all the sins of Sodom, taken as a cultural unit, deserve judgment in history as a warning to future societies? Each person has gifts and weaknesses. Each person's sins and successes are in terms of his gifts and environment, including his historical opportunities for good and evil. God judges us in terms of what we know, say, and do. This is what personal history is all about. We use the same line of argumentation concerning collectives. Each society, or separated set-apart group, has its specialized gifts and weaknesses. Each society's sins and su successes are in terms of the collective gifts and environment in that society, including its historical opportunities for good and evil. God judges societies in terms of what its members know, say, and do. This is what national history is all about. We recognize that some men are morally superior to others. The civil government, a collective responsibility such as juries, punishes convicted criminals, individuals, for their sinful actions. Other people get rewards, such as medals or public praise. History, therefore, has meaning. It makes a difference in history how people live. This difference is reflected in the judgments of men and God in history. We also recognize that some societies are better than others. One civil government punishes another, evil nations, in wartime for certain kinds of sinful actions. Other nations get rewards, such as military spoils or special trading rights. Historians write well of the victors. History therefore has meaning. It makes a difference in history how collectives live. This difference is reflected in the judgments of men and God in history. Thus we have to conclude that in some sense, God imputes Christ's righteousness to collectives. He certainly does this to the church. He presumably does this with nations. If he didn't, then why has he judged them in history the way he judged Sodom and Gomorrah? The blessings and cursings of Deuteronomy 28 include military victories, verse 7, or defeats, verse 25. Military events take place to collectives. A bad general makes decisions that affect his troops. Satan is just such a bad general, and his troops have suffered and will suffer again. The point is, collective judgments come in the midst of history, blessings and cursings. Victimless Crimes a popular argument today is that the state should not enforce laws against pornography, prostitution, homosexuality, gambling, or even drug abuse because such acts are voluntary acts between or among consenting adults. So long as they do not affect anyone who is not a party to the transaction, there should be no laws against such acts. But what is the biblical response? That God judges sin. Sexual sins are seen in the Bible as sins of idolatry. The whole book of Hosea is built around this theme. There is no such thing as a victimless crime. If society allows rampant public sin to go on without sanctions against it, it, a collective, has thereby sanctioned these sins. Its members have collectively, covenantally declared, We are not concerned about God's righteous requirements for us as individuals. We will continue in our sins. The result, as venereal disease testifies throughout history, is the judgment of God in history. In our day, AIDS threatens to become God's judgment against a society that has neglected his laws regarding homosexuality. Because God sees and hears, and because sins cry out to God in history, there can be no such thing as a victimless crime. Crime is crime. Crime is an attack on God, a defiance of his law. Adam and Eve sinned in private. They were consenting adults, but they sinned against God. They were punished by God. And as representatives for all humanity, they brought sin and judgment into our lives. God expects lawful, constituted, civil governments to restrain public evil. God's wrath will come upon any society that allows public evil to go on without opposition from the civil government. He will bring horribly painful judgments on those who do not participate in such sins.
but who are governed by evil rulers. This is what happened to the 7,000 righteous Jews who went into captivity to the Babylonians. Ruler of the Nations A ruler is a tool that establishes the limits of measurement. We call it a ruler because it limits us. But without the limits imposed by units of measurement, we would be blind. We could not exercise dominion. We would be flying blind. The limits imposed by a ruler is the basis of our freedom. Similarly, a ruling official imposes limits. He enforces a law. In the case of God, the law is imposed by the enforcer. God is the lawmaker and the judge. He is also the jury. He is the witness. But aren't there supposed to be at least two witnesses to convict a person? Yes, and there are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We say that God rules the nations. This must mean he rules the nations in history. If so, then this means that God judges the nations in history. Any ruler who refuses to impose his judgment on those under his authority has abdicated. He has resigned his office, or else he has died. God is dead. A few silly but consistent pagan theologians shouted to the world for about two years, 1966-68. to For a brief moment in history, intellectuals played openly with the death of God theology. The fad faded rapidly, but in reality, modern man acts as though he really does believe that God is dead. So did pagan man. So did Adam in his sin. Such a challenge really affirms the death of man. A person does not challenge the God of the Bible unless he is suicidal. Man knows who God is. Paul writes in the first chapter of Romans, but man rebelliously worships the creature rather than the creator, verses 18 through 23. So when men act as though God is dead, they call God's wrath down on them. They commit suicide. On the day that Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he did surely die and killed his posterity with him. If we do not preach to men that God judges individuals, groups, and nations in history, then we are adopting the false doctrine that God has abdicated his office and has stepped down from his throne. He may step, step back to his throne on Judgment Day or sometime during an earthly millennium in which Jesus physically returns to earth rule visibly on earth, but until then, we are saying there is no heavenly ruler of the nations. This leaves the office of judge open and the throne empty. Guess who will rush to the empty throne? Man. More specifically, power-seeking elitists who want to play God. There must always be judgment in history. The question is, whose? God's or man's? Summary. We have to affirm the Trinity. We have to affirm the equal ultimacy of the one and the many. We have to affirm the reality of individuals and collectives. We therefore have to affirm the reality of God's judgments in history against individuals and collectives. This is the message of the covenant. Sodom and Gomorrah were judged in the midst of their sins, in the midst of history. God sent no prophet to warn them. They were responsible before God for their sins, and in the midst of prosperity, the day of doom came upon them. God judges collectives. He will sometimes spare an evil collective for the sake of a few righteous people. But eventually judgment comes in history, and the righteous minority suffers. God judges collectives as collectives. The nations have broken God's covenant and have transgressed his laws, Isaiah warned. Thus, they are always ripe for historic judgment. Their citizens may pretend that they do not recognize God's claim on them, but they cannot play pretend forever. Eventually, judgment comes. Individualism denies the covenant. It denies that God judges collectives in the midst of time. Without covenant sanctions by God against nations, there can be no doctrine of covenant law over nations. Thus, individualism results in social antinomianism. There must be sanctification of individuals, definitive, progressive, and final. There must also be sanctification of collectives, definitive and progressive, though not final. Day of final judgment. This is the basis of all history, which includes individuals and collectives. There is no such thing as a victimless crime. A crime is a crime against God primarily and man secondarily. Thus, the state should enforce God's laws, even if the violators are consenting adults. A God who does not bring judgment against nations in history is not the ruler of nations. If he is the ruler of nations, then he does bring judgment against individuals and collectives. He does so in terms of his laws that govern individuals and collectives. In summary, 1. God judged 
Babel, Sodom, and Gomorrah. 2. God therefore judged nations other than Israel. 3. Responsibility is collective. 4. God has promised in the past to protect a whole society for the sake of a few righteous people. 5. He spared Judah for the sake of one righteous king. 6. The prophets warned pagan nations that they should repent. 7. Individualism denies the covenant. 8. God judges only individuals on Judgment Day, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. 9. He judges nations and groups within history. 10. A denial of collective judgment usually is accompanied by a denial of God's law for collectives. Blueprints. 11. Sanctification, God's setting apart morally, applies to individuals and also to collectives. 12. There is no such thing as a victimless moral crime. 13. A measuring ruler is a tool of dominion. So is a government ruler. Both impose limits. 14. God judges nations in history for disobeying his limits. 15. God has not abdicated his office as ruler in history.